Now, without further delay, let's begin today's event. Again, sponsored by Verato and hosted by Health Data Management. I'd like to introduce your moderator for today, and that is Mike Perkowski. Mike, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to today's web seminar. We're glad that you could join us. As you heard, my name is Mike Perkowski. I'm happy to be here as your moderator today. Before we get into it, I want to take a moment to acknowledge and thank Verado for sponsoring today's program. We really appreciate their support. This is obviously a very uh, interesting and important topic. We're glad that you could take a little bit of time out of your busy days to learn more about it. Fortunately, we have two expert speakers who are going to walk us through a number of the issues around patient matching and some of the challenges and some of the potential solutions for that. We're going to hear from Joaquin Neto, Vice President of Healthcare Solutions at Verado. Joaquin has decades of experience in information management and master data management technologies across a variety of industries, but he has a particular expertise in healthcare and in master patient index and health information exchange solutions. He has consulted and delivered solutions for healthcare providers and payers of all types, from Fortune 500 health systems to community hospitals. Before joining Verado, Joaquin worked at Initiate Systems and IBM. We're also going to hear from his colleague, Jason Bayan. Jason is Vice President of Sales for Verado, where he uh, oversees not only sales, but also business development. Jason has more than 20 years of experience in growing enterprise software companies, specifically in the data management space and in applications development. Previously, he has deployed and sold master data management solutions across a number of industries, including healthcare, as well as financial services, insurance, and retail for many Fortune 100 companies. So we're fortunate to have both Joaquin and Jason with us today. So with that, I'm going to turn the proceedings over to our first speaker, Jason Bayan. Jason, the floor is now yours. All right. Thank you, Mike, and thank you, everyone, for taking time out of your schedule today to, to join us on this topic. Um, before we get started too much into the presentation, just a quick anecdote um, really relates to the genesis of the title of this webinar, Why Patient Matching is Your HR's Achilles Heel. And it actually relates to my colleague, Joaquin, uh, who he and I spent a fair amount of time recently, uh, and many of you have as well, at the HIMSS event uh, in Las Vegas. And as many of you probably know, that uh, can be a pretty laborious event uh, with a fair amount of walking and running around everywhere. Um, Joaquim uh, had the unfortunate task to sort of meet with a lot of customers, a lot of different uh, partners and uh, potential partners of ours and potential prospects and customers. Uh, so we spent a fair amount of time during the event walking and doing a fair amount of uh, running around. Uh, when he got back, um, you know, he had some heel pain. Uh, in his Achilles and then essentially booked an appointment with his uh, primary care physician to actually uh, uh, investigate the issue uh, and you know showed up at his primary care physician's office uh, you know right through the registration process they were able to identify who he was able to identify his you know clinical records went to see his primary care physician uh, the guy diagnosed him with some plantar plantar fasciitis I think it was Joaquin and uh, you know, referred him uh, to another podiatrist to take a look at the actual uh, more investigative uh, process into his issue. Uh, prescribed him some uh, drugs. Uh, I think he went from there over to the pharmacy, picked up the uh, medication to sort of deal with the issue. Uh, good experience, went in, knew who Joaquin was, was able to actually use the app, uh, so integrated to, to see his patient record and pull back his pharmacy prescription. So real good interoperability experience, Joaquin, thus far. Uh, but then showed up in the podiatrist's office, uh, and I think he spent a fair amount of time uh, trying to identify himself, trying to identify, they spent some time trying to identify his insurance, um, trying to really uh, pinpoint uh, all of his previous records with some faxes and some communication and, and uh, trying to gather up all of his previous uh, interactions, um, kind of a poor uh, interoperability experience. So, you know, the title of this uh, webinar um, why patient matching is your EHR's Achilles heel is, uh, was his idea based on his own personal experience. Um, I myself had my own personal experiences with patient matching as I have twin boys who uh, are 15 years old now and when they were babies they would constantly be merged constantly when I would show up to pharmacies or doctor's offices. Um, the ability to, to identify each uniquely one of them uh, was a real challenge for you know each of the offices, the hospital, the EHR's. Um, 
to say who Jackson Bynes was and who Tyler Bynes was. Um, and those names are not even all that similar. So uh, personal experiences to start us off uh, with, uh, you know, the genesis of the uh, title of this uh, webinar. Um, in terms of the agenda today uh, we have um, put together for you, I'm going to start off uh, talking, about, talking about accurate patient matching and sort of how that's foundational to your HR. Um, talk a lot about, you know, the, I guess the context and the background of EHRs and how patient interoperability is dependent on patient matching. Um, and talk a little bit about the struggle with patient matching uh, as it relates to these EHRs. Um, and then essentially put it in better context and talk about the implications and the financial implications in terms of inaccurate patient matching and what the costs are relative to those organizations. Uh, Joaquin will take over and we'll make a transition then and he'll talk about referential matching as the new paradigm in patient matching um, and talk about Verado's two solutions, uh, the ways referential matching can be in, essentially improve your EHR's patient matching challenges and then we'll do a brief Q&A uh, to answer some of the questions from the audience and You'll see during the course of this presentation, we're going to make it interactive as well. We'll have some, some polls to take uh, to sort of validate some of the things that we're saying and, and provide greater context. So by way of uh, some background, let me give you a little bit of an introduction to Verado. Um, Verado itself as an organization, uh, we are uh, dedicated to this patient matching problem. So while we have, and you heard some of the introduction by uh, Mike on our background, having come from Initiate and MPI companies, you know, we do have a combined 70, that's probably low these days, we're probably up near 90, 100 years of personal experience um, in this particular technology and space. Um, likewise, we have, you know, data scientists, engineers, architects, solution architects, customer success and delivery folks, all focused on this problem of patient matching. And so to date, invested about 150,000 hours of development and data science expertise in the technologies that we're bringing to market to address the patient matching challenges. You know, the technologies and solutions that we'll talk about later in the second half of this portion of this webinar um, are really being used uh, and, and market tested to the point where we've answered and Verado as a company and solution has answered billions of identity queries from our various customers and partners uh, to the point where about close to half the U.S. population right now, uh, the existing people that live in the, in the States, um, their records, their, tech, their demographics, their information is actually flowing through in some way or another through our customers, and you can see a list of those folks listed below some of the sort of uh, prominent customers. Um, their data is flowing through those customers and thus flowing through Verado. So a good market-tested uh, experience uh, with a lot of you know, expertise and background in this particular problem. Um, just to give greater clarity sort of our mission, so while we're dedicated to patient matching, um, you know, our, our mission, our, our objective as a company is to improve the state of patient matching. And so in doing so, we're, we're essentially bringing to market and have brought to market two specific uh, technologies and solutions that can really help you improve your patient matching experience. So number one, uh, and very simply put, number one, we make existing HRs and MPIs better by using our Verado Auto Steward service. Um, number two, uh, in situations where organizations may not have an EHR, may not have an MPI, or uh, may essentially have maybe multiple EMRs or multiple MPIs, we have a full-blown master person index technology, a next generation solution um, that Joaquin will dive into greater detail on both of these things that we offer to the market. Um, we'll go into a greater detail about both of these particular technologies. But to get back to the topic at hand, in terms of um, the EHRs and you know the importance of patient matching within those solutions, you know, nearly pretty much every health system these days has deployed, uh, and large systems essentially may have multiples, and most people do, um, have deployed these electronic health record systems. And you know, this audience probably knows better than I, you know, the the implications and the value of deploying this technology uh, throughout the healthcare you know ecosystem. You know, the whole intent of these technologies and the investment in millions of dollars, tens of millions in some situations, uh, is to essentially, you know, better coordinate care, better coordinate the delivery of care and all of the processes associated with that, um, ultimately for the patient. And, you know, in doing so, these technologies, you know, are made up of uh, a host of different modules uh, that are different pieces, different facets of the, of the process, whether it be revenue cycle or pharmacy, 
um, or some specialty end to the particular EHR. Um, everything from scheduling all the way to registration and delivering care, these EHRs are really designed to provide sort of a full suite of functionality uh, for the patient through the process of delivering healthcare services. And that's from the beginning to the end, to the clinicals, to the billing, to all of the implications and all sort of the ancillary processes that um, are around it. And really the value in having these really robust, uh, complex systems and having all of these modules is that you have an integrated solution where you can essentially you know, take the patient through all of these processes, take the patient through all of um, the necessary services and workflows um, that you know, a normal hospital system, a normal health system uh, needs to provide. So really the value is in having all of these particular components and these modules in the same piece of, te in the same piece of technology, you know, ultimately shepherding uh, the patient through these processes. However, and the, you know, the challenge uh, in doing that, while the value is in sort of the interoperability um, and having these modules, you know, it's a fundamental foundation uh, throughout you know, all of these different modules is to be able to have uh, this you know, patient interoperability, meaning the patient identity that exists within these EMRs and EHRs um, is consistent you know, as that patient works through and as that patient is represented in the many modules, the many facets, the many workflows um, of, the, of this entire you know, coordinated integrated system. So patient matching uh, is really foundational to all of the capability of the EHR. So we understand that they're tremendously valuable um, and they've done a lot to advance uh, healthcare services uh, and they fundamentally uh, require that the patient and the information about the particular patient uh, is correct. And really the sort of the patient matching is sort of the unsung hero in this very complex and, you know, at times massive uh, system that, uh, that actually, you know, coordinates the information, coordinates the care of the particular patient. And, um, and so uh, in looking at these, you know, these complex environments, these complex EMRs, um, inaccurate patient matching. So if you're, the design of the system is to interoperate amongst the different specialties and modules within the EHR, patient matching is really uh, foundational uh, and it's complex um, and it's required to be able to have the value and the benefit and the interoperability uh, amongst all those different modules. So if you do it poorly, um, and in most cases, these organizations, these EHRs, uh, you know, frankly, are not focused on patient matching and instead focused on all the many modules that they have, um, they're challenged to really represent the patient uniquely, and really um, focus on the ability to unify the actual information about a particular patient and make sure that that's consistent throughout all of this. And, and the software vendors that produce these EHRs, um, they're very focused on the broad range of capabilities, but they're not focused and not uh, experts, uh, as we are, for instance, on really the identification uh, and the unification of patient data that is, as we've talked about, foundational to the rest of all of these uh, processes and, and technologies. And they have some algorithmic processes, uh, but they're largely sort of insufficient. We're going to get into the details and the assessment of what's happening in the market to sort of substantiate, um, you know, really that claim. So when we talk about the inefficiencies and the problems and the challenges of patient matching, um, you know, the root of these things and the really the, the challenge is these duplicates, these patient identities that are replicated throughout these EHRs that based upon, you know, the complexity of the actual underlying data and the, you know, strength of their quote-unquote algorithms, um, it really can produce these things called duplicates. And these duplicates, if you think about it, that's the, you know, that's the real, that's the arrow in the Achilles heel of these EHRs because they basically break down all that value and all of the, um, you know, automata and, and, and process and workflow and automation that can happen within the EHRs. Um, the duplicates are actually sort of the pain uh, and break down the value of all these other modules within the particular system. And so, you know, the, this notion of, uh, you know, having duplicates within the system, um, having uh, suspect duplicates within the system, you know, is a, is a fairly large problem and I think one that most people will get to some of the discussion around what you guys see, but um, most people that can recognize most people have essentially 
um, invested uh, energy and invested a lot of um, time and effort into, you know, supplementing the EHR's capability of identifying a particular individual um, with some human intervention. Um, and, and really, um, you know, that, that has come at a tremendous cost to both the industry and to, you know, the individual org organizations that are deploying these EHRs. So let me talk a little bit about like some of the background of why this is happening as I sort of set up the particular problem and, and what really our perspective is on the, on the market and why it's really so hard. So, um, and this organization or this audience is probably very familiar with the sort of state of things um, both historically and now, but you know, historically the you know, uh, hospital systems operating environment um, was not simple. It's simple relative to today's standards. Um, but it, you know, we had distributed systems and we had multiple systems where maybe a patient identity could exist. And the EHRs were brought in to unify that process. And there was a, let's say, relative to these days, a smaller number of data sources and a smaller volume of data that was electronic and was actually being transmitted amongst these modules and organizations or uh, departments. And so we had a very, um, you know, relative to today's standards, simple uh, environment where, you know, the volume and the complexity was, was in a way limited. Uh, and unfortunately, uh, and fortunate because it's advancing the healthcare services and, and the industry as a whole, um, things have gotten far, far more complex. So the actual operating environment now is grown in its complexity in sort of two major ways. Number one, the number of data sources about a particular patient um, and the number of systems that are used to house that patient information and contribute, let's say, to the EHR and the master patient index capabilities inside an EHR has grown exponentially. So it has grown significantly with the advent of new applications, new processes, new analytics, um, you know, all of the uh, new uh, and, you know, complex systems that are actually contributing essentially, you know, more ties to the EMR uh, in today's you know, operating environment. Now you combine that with essentially a, a massive or explosion of also the data, so not only the sources of data that are contributing patient data, but the sort of just the pure volume of data. And you're getting a incredibly, you know, broader and more complex environment. Uh, and relating back to the problem that we're talking about, these duplicates, these suspect duplicates, um, as the volume of data increases and as the number of contributing source systems that are providing patient data to the MPI capability inside an EHR, as that increases, the probability of these things, when you have more JSON buy-ins, when you have more JSONs and more people that look like JSON, the number of duplicates, the number of suspects, all of that increases exponentially and becomes um, a significant uh, sort of uh, explosion in, you know, essentially, uh, the presence of these things that, again, is sort of eroding the overall value of the EHR. And so we have a more complex environment from the con uh, contributing systems. On the flip side of that, we also have a uh, much more complex environment on the sort of consumption of that information. So as many of you know, uh, we have uh, basically exposed and started to expose your own data to the consumers, to the individuals. You've develop patient engagement application, patient portals and PHRs, and you're starting to do more advanced analytics, and you're starting to trade information and exchange information with not just your organization, but with other organizations um, in order to you know, more effectively treat uh, the particular patient. The organization is growing more complex by the fact that you know, it may be consolidating and merging with other hospitals and other health systems, which is again sort of putting um, pressure back onto these systems and ultimately back onto the underlying patient data that can exist in all of these particular systems. So it's really growing, um, you know, much more complex in, in a variety of different sort of vectors. Um, and that is essentially putting, you know, greater strains uh, on the, you know, the foundational aspect of patient matching and patient identification. And so there's really, um, you know, looking at a, a real backdrop of really how we're doing within the industry, and I had made mention before, is, you know, as we've seen the deployment of EHRs uh, continue, um, 
and the notion of we're digitizing the electronic health record and we're providing uh, more access to electronic health record, um, as we've sort of talked about, this the situ situation that we're facing is that the, and as we would predict and as we talked about with the complexity, the problem of these duplication rates and rising duplication rates um, is growing as well. So it's uh, growing, frankly, uh, very quickly. So there's been sort of two major surveys um, that we can sort of draw some empirical data from. In 2008, uh, an analysis by HEMA uh, suggested that there was about 8 to 12 percent average duplication uh, in a common EHR, uh, in a common health system. So uh, now, uh, 10 years later, um, you know, where we would expect as we've deployed EHRs and maybe the problem, you know, in deploying these EHRs has gotten better, maybe it hasn't. It's actually gotten worse by the, all the reasons that we were talking about before. We see that, row, uh, that rate uh, according to Black Book Market Research, that rate has gone at 18% uh, in their study in 2018, so the, just this year. Um, you know, that, that, that's a massive increase in the uh, duplication rate amongst these organizations, uh, and, you know, largely we feel like it's contributed uh, to by the complexity of the environment, the volume of the, the data, the growing, all of the reasons that I, uh, that I talked about before. Um, now, if you extrapolate that number, that 18% out to 2020, that rate could grow to you know, a projected rate of 20% duplication in the average health system for patient data and patient records. Uh, now, that's sort of in sharp contrast to uh, the ONC study in 2016, um, where they came out with a roadmap that suggested that the average hospital, the average health system, uh, should get to about a 0.5% uh, mandate in terms of a duplication rate. So we're we're obviously, uh, and this is kind of sort of sobering uh, statistics, we're really uh, essentially you know, working in the, oper uh, the, the opposite direction uh, of where we need to be as these things are growing and as essentially the mandates and the demands for this information uh, are increasing. And really when it comes down to it, um, and we're going to get into this in a little bit here, um, the fundamental problem, you know, when we talk about patient duplication, talk about patient identification, um, is that the patient data uh, is the sort of the root of the problem. So uh, there's a common statistic that uh, is out there that we often quote that, you know, 30% of the demographic information that exists in these EHRs is out of date, incorrect, or incomplete. Um, and what we mean by that uh, is that uh, really this data, and not for nefarious reasons, not for any, you know, um, poor job that we're all doing, it's just there's sort of an innate volatility and, you know, to this data and problematic sort of processes that collect this data. So this data, um, if you think about it, over time names can change, addresses change, phones change, people move, so inherently there's a uh, volatility to the underlying data. Um, you know, there are errors and, and transcription errors that we get uh, through the process of just collecting this information. All of this data fundamentally is fl flooded into the EHR uh, combined with ambiguities that are just naturally occurring uh, and incompleteness. And again, it's not any sort of nefarious reasons, but you know, this is the, you know, the, the state of the data that the EHRs are dealt with. And so what they do is, and commonly uh, these EHRs have produced technologies and processes to essentially try to uh, detect these duplicates, try to assess, um, you know, the duplicates within their system. But frankly, they're only as good as the underlying patient demographic data. So we talked about, you know, the, the notion that there is naturally reoccurring um, and sort of, you know, impossible to stop issues and, and occurrences of the data. Um, we're seeing, you know, that trend continue that's not going to discontinue. And so they've built algorithmic functions and algorithmic technologies to try to attempt to uh, uh, address that problem. And here is a, here's a uh, sort of you know, simple illustration of what we're talking about. If you look at two EHR records, you've got Catherine Smith on the left-hand side, Kat Johnson on the right-hand side, um, you know, 123 Main Street, 456 Elm Street. So there are subtle inconsistencies amongst these two patient records. Uh, that would prevent a normal EHR from actually identifying, and this person could be the actual same person. You got a date of birth that's the same, 
but this could be simply a situation where uh, that person simply got married and moved. And so the algorithmic functions that are inside these EHRs are attempting to discern whether or not that's the same person, but frankly, they're, you know, can be duped and can be, um, you know, fooled by sort of common, very simple inconsistencies in the underlying demographic data. They all take a pairwise comparison approach, so they take one record and compare it to the other record, and if any of those sort of inconsistencies exist, they essentially um, are tripped up and essentially can't identify, um, you know, who that person was. And so, again, these are sort of common issues and common errors that can occur within the data that, frankly, everybody here probably, um, you know, has come across this stuff personally and has had these things happen to themselves. So actually, as a means to sort of illustrate the point, um, working to a particular poll here, oops, I've, we've got a poll here that I'm, I would just ask the audience if you guys could uh, fill out. Um, you know, I've asked, essentially, our data scientists have come back with can, you know, some identified situations that really do contribute to the EHR's inability uh, to track or this, this notion that the demographic information could be inconsistent and thus, you know, essentially elude detection of a duplicate. I would ask that you guys, if you could, um, and all of this uh, information is anonymous, it's a, uh, a poll, if you could fill out or click the appropriate things that, you know, personally you guys have uh, seen or had happened to yourself where maybe you've moved within the past two years, you've moved twice within the past five years, um, maybe you've changed your name uh, after marriage or, or some other event, um, or if your name is periodically misspelled. Um, if you guys could fill out this uh, survey here, this, this uh, poll, and sort of substantiate, as we said, the demographic information is, is pretty volatile and it is moving all the time. So if you've got situations like you have a twin or a sibling um, with a similar name or a child uh, situation, um, we can illustrate the point that these things, these events that are happening within the patient demographic data and within your own personal data are actually happening. And I'll give it a second to, uh, uh, to collect the results if uh, that for me. And again, this is an anonymous survey. Um, Take a second here, you guys can fill this out. So, give it a second here, we'll go to the results to look and see. Here we go. So, um, you know, this is very consistent with our expectations, right? So, 43% um, of the population of the attendees uh, have moved in the past two years. Uh, they've, you know, 43% have moved uh, twice in the past five years. Uh, maybe you've got the name change, only 4%. 60% uh, reported on the phone here um, have had a misspelling or it's commonly and periodically misspelled uh, name on some forms. So if you look at these ty types of statistics, we can sort of validate the notion that this demographic data that we're being, that the EHRs are leveraging is very volatile and can be problematic actually to ultimately try to address in terms of patient matching. Let's move on and let's talk about this. So the way the EHRs, and, and let's talk about sort of like how they operate, right, um, and how they work. So the EHRs collect this demographic information about the particular patients. Um, this data, you can see it's sort of, you know, <laughs> simply illustrated by the two people on the left-hand side with the question mark. That data comes into an algorithmic process, a, as I mentioned before, a pairwise process where one record is compared to another record. And it goes through this algorithmic, algorithmic function and this function essentially produces a result that says, yeah, I consider the same two records, those two records, the back to the example, Catherine and Cat record to be the same person. Um, or they can produce a result that says, you know, obviously that's not the same person, that's totally, you know, distinct, unique people. Um, and and they're essentially the algorithm also can produce sort of a third um, outcome, which is I, I think it might be the same person. I think record, you know, A and record B, uh, are, there's enough information that potentially what I want to do is I want to get a human involved. I want to actually um, have somebody look at this, a data steward, an HIM professional. Um, so what we're really doing, what the EHRs are actually doing, and this is sort of commonplace these days, uh, is actually supplementing their own technology with essentially, you know, human investment, human involvement in the decisions of patient matching. 
Um, and that's a, you know, that doesn't come at a small cost. That's involving humans to do this process, and we're going to get into that in a second. But um, these folks are dedicated to uh, essentially prop up the performance of the EHR's uh, patient matching capability. So if you look, and, and really what, and this is uh, a good sort of representation of what's happening within these potential mass matches, is that frankly, and most organizations that I work with and I deal with, um, essentially have a team of data stewards, have a team of HIM professionals that are tasked with resolving these ambiguous scenarios. Uh, the unfortunate part is that the rate at which these folks, and you can see on the, on the bottom line, the rate at which these folks can actually resolve these tasks, resolve these data stewardship items, uh, these potential duplicates, um, is less than the rate at which these things are generated, just based upon um, you know, the, the creation of these things, the complexity or the sophistication of the EHR's algorithm. Um, everyone I'm speaking with, most organizations, I shouldn't say everyone, most organizations that we're talking to and most organizations that we work with um, are generating what we refer to as a backlog of these particular things. So they essentially have latent duplicates or suspect duplicates that are sitting within their EHR that are unresolved. And while they have made the, you know, sort of heavy investment into deploying data stewards, deploying HIM staff um, to deal with these, uh, they really never can keep up. And this is sort of absent if you sort of see this linear, uh, linear graph. Um, this is absent events where these things, you know, come in in bulk. So these, you know, M&A activity, acquisition of new physician groups, inclusion of new hospitals, those types of events can spike these, these generation rates and create, you know, an even larger backlog when what we see is organizations can have tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and some of our customers and some of our organizations we work with could have historically millions of these things happen. Um, you know, you probably, and this audience is probably familiar with the events of, you know, historically cleaning up these uh, uh, things that happen and, and sort of going at it at a, you know, one-time event where you're going to bang away and, and, and try to resolve all of these at one time. And then what happens is you get back to this particular growth rate and you're, again, generating these things uh, again. And it's really, um, you know, problematic and labor intensive to address these things uh, that are sort of latent and sitting within your EHRs. Let's, sorry. Um, so really you're faced with kind of uh, really two, in our opinion, bad options, right? Um, Number one, option one, is you can staff up to have a whole bunch of these data stewards, a whole bunch of these HIM professionals, and you can try to shrink that backlog uh, and shrink it uh, as best you can. Uh, option two is to really just sort of have few data stewards, um, you know, and just sort of deal with the fact that uh, the backlog is just going to be sort of this ever-growing concept of suspect duplicates floating within your EHR. So let's uh, take a second here. We're going to do another poll and sort of put our uh, our statements to some of the tests of the audience. Um, we've got a poll here. Uh, so how many data stewards or health information management professionals, and there's other sort of names for these folks that may be part of the patient experience group, or um, how many uh, of those folks does your organization employ to sort of manually resolve these things? And, you know, realize there's also these sort of batch events, and sometimes people bring on temporary staff through a process, but how many of, uh, how many folks does your organization currently um, employ to actually uh, address this gap, address this uh, potential duplicates that are out there? The zero to one, two to five, six to ten, uh, and sometimes greater than ten, and to be honest, so some folks won't know, and that, that's okay too. Um, it may be outside your purview, but uh, it would be interesting to see, again, we're going to put this to the test of whether or not uh, what we see and what we say is uh, the same thing. Give it a second here as we collect the data, if you wouldn't mind. Again, it's an anonymous survey, um, so we're not capturing any of the results and tying them back to identity. So, 52% uh, so I said I don't know. Uh, that's okay. Um, but if you look at the remaining half of the participants on the phone, um, almost, you know, well, the you know 40% of those, uh, the remaining half is basically greater than 10 individuals are actually dedicated to this particular problem. So greater than 10 of a team of data scientists that are working against this stuff. And likewise, you can see you know I would say amongst the folks that actually do know, um, you know there's a quarter of them that are two to five. So these are 
there are resources dedicated, and you know, as we've said uh, uh, before, that this is a uh, a environment where, unfortunately, you have to supplement the EHR's capability with uh, human capital, um, and that's obviously uh, represented here too. So, just to sort of scratch back a little bit more to the particular problem, one more poll for the audience. Uh, again, anonymous survey. Um, how many potential duplicate tasks are in your backlog? And that's that backlog is, uh, you know, kind of our terminology, although most people, I think, do refer to it that. Um, awaiting manual remediation. So how much, uh, you know, how much stuff, we've mentioned that customers are, we've seen tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, in some cases millions of these things that exist within uh, people's environment, depending upon the volume of their data. So uh, less than 10,000, 10,000 to 100,000, uh, 100,000 to 500,000, greater than 500,000, or you don't know. And again, um, interestingly enough, this particular statistic, you know, it, it's a, uh, I would say, in working with lots of prospects and customers, you know, it's not one that is at the tip of the tongue of everybody that we talk to. It's something that is really held within particularly the department. Um, it may not be aware uh, all the way up to other folks within the organization. Um, so it's okay not to know, and, and in fact, it, it kind of changes over time too, because like I said, there could be mass events where you have mergers and acquisitions and other things that happen um, that can kind of you know, complicate this particular number. So it's okay to say I don't know, but um, would, if you have a handle on it, it would be great if you could submit uh, a response. Let's see uh, where we end up here. I'm going to close it. So 60% I don't know, but um, we've got – uh, of the people that responded, you know, there's uh, you know, close to 20% uh, are in the 10,000 to 500,000 range. So, um, you know, that's a fair amount if you think about the individuals dedicated to this particular problem. You know, a staff of 10, a staff of 5, um, there's only so many minutes in the day that they can work to resolve these things. So if this backlog exists, which means, you know, as we've talked about before in the graph, this thing is probably getting bigger over time, um, so it's going to continue to grow. As long as your HIM staff, your data stewards can't keep pace with it, it's going to just continue to grow, and it's going to, again, plague uh, the performance of the actual EHR. So it can be, continue to be problematic uh, and, and actually exist. So let's transition a little bit, and let me tell you a little bit, you know, finishing up the discussion. So we've talked about the EHRs and how patient matching uh, is really foundational and is also uh, sort of the arrow in the Achilles heel of their intended purpose. Um, talked about sort of what happens and how organizations have um, dealt with the deficiencies within the HR and its patient matching. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the actual, you know, impact, the financial cost of, um, you know, a duplicate uh, to a particular health system. So uh, fortunate enough, we have some recent surveys as well uh, in 2016 and 2018, uh, one by the Ponymount Institute and one by Black Book Market Research. Um, so, you know, the first one uh, is most recent where, you know, it can cost as much as $2,000 per inpatient stay uh, for a particular patient duplicate record. Um, so, you know, this is, uh, you know, duplicative, uh, duplicative procedures, duplicative tests, labs, sort of the administrative cost of dealing with a patient when there is an existing duplicate record out there within the systems. Um, you know, Likewise, it can cost as much as $800 per emergency room de uh, department uh, visit for every duplicate record that exists in, this, uh, in the hospital. And then um, from a uh, claims and insurance perspective, um, in the uh, same Black Book Market Research study, uh, they talk about almost as much as one-third uh, of uh, denied claims are actually related to the inaccuracy of patient matching, uh, upwards of you know, over 17 million dollars, uh, according to the, the Ponymon Institute, of essentially denied claims for having a misidentification of a particular patient record. So there are obviously some real financial costs. Um, most organizations relative to these particular problems are investing heavily in, you know, for $17.5 million. Um, organizations are largely putting sort of manual labor, again, behind this problem and trying to resolve and, and chase down uh, the particular denied claims, but the root cause is back to this uh, patient matching challenge, patient matching issue. Um, 
you know, there, those are the sort of hard costs, and there is obviously uh, soft cost. in most organizations that we're working with, most organizations in our market and our industry, is very, very um, interested in managing the patient experience and managing, um, you know, their satisfaction and their interaction with your particular facility. So, you know, there's again um, some recent uh, investigative uh, surveys uh, that sort of shed light on this particular issue. Um, you know, from Ahima talking about how uh, essentially there are real implications, that there's like a cascade of errors that can occur uh, when there is a patient identification error. Uh, and the most sobering probably of these statistics is that the, um, in the uh, Ponymon Institute study that 86% of the nurses and physicians and IT practitioners say they've witnessed uh, a medical error that was a result of a misidentification. And that's, you know, um, that has going to be a direct effect on um, you know the, the patient experience and the um, you know, the the services rendered to the particular patient. And then lastly, you know there is uh, greater participation these days in consu with consumers uh, within healthcare and within the healthcare ecosystem. So uh, as if you remember the graph that or the slide that we talked about, the inclusion of the consumer through patient portals and patient engagement applications. So the the consumers are actually participating. Um, you know, more uh, now than ever before uh, in their healthcare services in the, you know, uh, and have access and, and essentially transparency into how their medical records are being transmitted, organized, um, you know, and, and shared between their healthcare organizations. And so we've got another survey here and talking about the, the consumer's real uh, perspective um, is that 88% of the consumers, like, blame the hospital system for dissatisfaction with the lack of portability of their healthcare records. So, you know, as we open this situation, or as we open up um, our healthcare organizations to the consumer, as we bring the consumer into that process and into the services rendered, um, you know, there, there can be tremendous uh, dissatisfaction if it's perceived that you're not managing the medical records, not managing the actual data correctly. Um, and that's a, you know, for our industry, it's a pretty sobering statistic and thought that the individual's judgment um, can come into play here when they have really, you know, we've exposed the IT systems, they exposed the data, they exposed the services and processes to the end consumer. Um, now they can start to formulate their own opinion of the organizations and, and their uh, quality. So I'm going to transition at this point uh, in sort of setting up, uh, like I've said, I've talked through the, the EHRs and their complexity, their found, you know, reliance on patient matching. Uh, the, the process that they employ, the results of that process, and the financial implications. I was going to turn it over to Joaquim at this point in time, and I wanted Joaquim to talk through um, really talking about essentially historically uh, what has been used in terms of patient matching, and then really talking about a technology that, our technology that's new, um, that actually can improve the patient matching, you know, with a reasonable investment. Joaquim? Right on. Thanks, Jason. Uh, thanks for teeing up, teeing up the problem. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll just I'll just kind of reinforce that last point there on the consumer. That was uh, and me as the unwitting uh, inspiration for the Achilles heel analogy. Um, you know that that really was uh, what you know you know got me thinking more about this. Is as a consumer, um, I realized I went in and I had sort of these two experiences. One was really good patient identification experience where my records are transferred to the pharmacy and I got what I needed done easily and painlessly. And then the next day I had the exact opposite experience <laughs> going to this other, you know, uh, referral um, and was just totally dissatisfied with the experience. And I realized that, um, you know, there really is an expect increasing expectation now that, um, you know, we're going to have high quality data, um, you know, as the cons not only as a consumer, but also some of the more you know, uh, I'd say advanced users of healthcare IT technology. So uh, Jason referenced the, you know, pop health platforms and new analytics and predictive analytics solutions. A lot of kind of, you know, cutting edge stuff that, that people are investing in uh, really does rely on this concept. So um, anyway, so let's go through here and I'll just take 10 minutes or so and kind of talk to you about uh, some new ways to approach this problem that, that we've been investing in and we really think have an opportunity to, um, you know, kind of change the game here. Um, so to, to kind of, you know, restate the problem, uh, Jason, you know, um, explained the stats on the underlying data issues. And we really do think that's the fundamental problem here, that um, there's just a significant portion of the data that's inside of your EHR 
um, is um, the data is either old or out of date or it has um, missing information. Um, and, you know, organizations are trying to, you know, uh, address that problem, improving processes and intake and registration to better collect data, and that's great. Um, but it's not, you know, that's not doing the job, especially as the, you know, scale of the data that we're trying to manage goes up so, um, you know, so greatly, as Jason was talking about. Um, and then, and then the, combine that with the fact that we're basically using, you know, technology that's, you know, 90s technology. There really has been no innovation uh, in this patient matching space um, in the last, you know, 10 or 15 years. Um, and so we're trying to solve a kind of a big, uh, a big hairy data problem with um, technology that was meant to solve kind of a smaller problem. So, um, so what can we do about that? Um, the, the, the idea that we propose is this referential matching idea. Um, and so the, it all starts with, with this data. So again, acknowledging that it's really the, the underlying data that's the problem. Um, what we're doing is we're bringing in an answer key, if you will. So um, a reference database that has um, high quality demographic data on the U.S. population. Um, so we'll explain how we create this and manage it and curate it um, and so forth. But the idea is really to attack that data problem. Um, and if we can bring in high quality data to kind of, uh, you know, fill in the gaps in the data that's inside of your EHRs to, you know, overcome some of the issues that are, are uh, kind of inherent to that EHR-based data, um, then we're going to have a much better chance of preventing duplicates and, and establishing that complete view of a patient. Um, and the benefit of this approach, it's not just that you get a more accurate result, which is really, right, what we want, um, but it's also that you can do it in a much easier way. So, you know, using modern technology, using a software as a service approach, um, you can plug this solution in without nearly the, you know, heavyweight lifting that you had to do with traditional um, matching technologies, whether those were, you know, um, standalone MPIs or, uh, you know, data quality type jobs or things like that that required kind of lots of hand-holding. By using this reference matching approach, um, you can really plug these in, in a much, uh, with much less effort. So as I mentioned, it starts with this idea of a reference database. So what we do is we take publicly available data um, on, um, uh, on uh, person demographics, um, things like uh, credit header information, so not, not actual credit reports, but, um, you know, if you go out and go apply for a loan, um, you know, a bank's going to run a credit check on you, um, and the way they do that is by searching on your demographic information, your name, your date of birth, your address, so forth, the exact same data attributes that we manage inside of um, EHRs to manage a medical record. Um, and so the reason they can do that is because they have this, you know, um, database on your demographic profile and, and that you, they can use to identify you. Um, so we take that type of data um, and then we curate that for use in the healthcare environment. Um, so, um, you know, the good things about that type of data, that type of uh, credit-oriented data, but there's also some pieces of it that aren't perfect. Um, you know, if you, if you move and you go uh, to a new apartment, you're not buying a house, you're not applying for a loan or anything, you go to move to a new apartment, um, the credit uh, agencies won't know that your address has changed, for example. Um, so we combine that uh, financial type data with other data, utility type data, you know, phone data, other public records, um, things that will get updated uh, when you move, just for example. Um, and therefore, by combining these different data sets, um, we can create this really robust demographic data profile. Again, the same exact attributes that we used to identify someone in a healthcare setting, whether that's, you know, in a hospital or a clinic or practice or uh, a member on the member side and payer side. Um, it's the same demographic data, but we're taking that from these multiple sources, um, and then we're applying, um, you know, both technology and then also just data science expertise and resources to build that up into this, you know, very reliable um, answer key uh, reference information for, and you can kind of think of it as almost a pre-built MPI um, that you can look up uh, your patients against and use that to ensure you get the right matching result. So this is not easy to do. Um, it's, you know, a massive scale um, problem. Um, but by doing it kind of once um, and, and doing it right um, and then making that available as a, you know, a, you think of it as a resource that you can use to improve the matching in your environment, um, regardless of what that environment looks like. And, and that's what I'll get into here for a couple minutes. 
Um, so the way this works is if you if you think about kind of the traditional MPI matching process, and again, this is either you know the the patient uh, index inside of your individual EHR if you're an all epic or all server shop, um, or it's the third party off the shelf MPI if you have you know an, uh, an initiator, next gate, or something like that that's you know combining records together. Um, the way those things work is you compare two records against each other, um, and the little balls on the Tinker Tor diagram here are the different attributes, you know, a name and date of birth or an address or something. Um, and if those things line up against each other, you know, the names are the same and the addresses are the same, the date of birth is the same, you know, maybe there's a typo here or there, um, then you know it's the same person. Um, you reuse that same medical record number or you merge them if this is identified after the fact, and, and that's how you maintain clean records. Um, the issue is that a lot of times, because of that underlying data issue we were talking about, the data on your two different records just doesn't line up. You know, you, you have different addresses because the people presented at different points in time. Um, so if you use this referential matching idea, then all of a sudden it's okay if those attributes don't, don't line up. As long as your, your medical record A matches against reference record 19 and medical record B matches against the reference person record number 19, you know they're the same person, even if they matched on different data elements. So different data elements that came in at different times or um, any other variations that can happen. Um, and taking that approach uh, gives you this huge uplift um, in accuracy um, versus the traditional approach. So to go back to that example that Jason brought up before with the Catherine Smith and the Cat Johnson, if you're looking at those you know, on their own, there's just they, they don't look similar at all. There's nothing that would lead you to believe they're the same person. But as soon as you look at that through the lens of a, of a reference database, um, it becomes an obvious match. Uh, this is an obvious duplicate that needs to be addressed. Um, you, you've got Catherine Smith, and you have the record on file that she got married and now goes by Cat Johnson. She used to live at 123 Main Street. Now we have on file that her address changed. She moved to 456 Elm Road. Um, one record had the date of birth, and that's great. You know, that matches the reference record. The other record was missing the date of birth, but it's got a phone number that's on file. And so you see everything is lined up, and this is kind of an extreme example, but it, it does illustrate the idea and it kind of paints the picture of how powerful this reference matching approach um, can be. So, you know, I mentioned that this is a, you know, this is a cloud service, and that's important, you know, not just, not just because of, you know, uh, sort of uh, um, uh, taking advantage of things like scalability and having this be a highly performance solution. Um, it's uh, you know very controlled environment, so we are totally HIPAA compliant, high trust certified. You know we can pour tons of resources into the security aspect because it's a single uh, service, um, and then um, we offer it through uh, you know very modern APIs that are easy to integrate. So with the last couple of minutes we have here, I'll just talk through that a little bit. Um, Jason mentioned these two different ways solutions we have for deploying this referential matching technology, and basically the easiest way to think of it is. If you have a single EHR, you know, you're, you're an all-cern or all-epic shop or, or, you know, other EHRs too, um, then we can plug in this matching service just directly into that EHR. Um, and uh, it's sort of a very lightweight implementation, and it basically just automatically resolves your potential duplicates. It works just like a, a human data store, but it's, it's automated and so much more economical and accurate. Um, the other is if you have multiple MPIs, so you are in one of these more complex environments, um, that has uh, multiple EHRs, um, and what you really need is a, um, you know, what you really need is a system to connect them together. Um, then we can deploy this as a kind of a full function in MPI. So what it, what it looks like this auto steward idea um, is uh, this is another view of that you have your EHR um, on the left. You see it produce those those tasks that Jason was talking through the backlog before. Um, you very simply, you just take those tasks. Your interface engine can pull those tasks out of the EHR, um, make calls to the Vrata web service, and you get back an answer, you know, kind of just like the answer that one of your human data stewards would create if they pulled the record up individually, looked at it side by side, maybe if they did some, you know, searches on the web through some reference information, um, and they ultimately came to a decision. That's the output you get from this auto steward service, um, and it's just derived from this reference data that's on file. Um, and then you very simply take that and you, you process that as merge inside of your EHR. So, um, you know, this is a new, it's definitely a new approach to doing this. 
um, and and it's one that works in a variety of situations, um, which is which is what's really nice. Um, we've done this a bunch of times for different um, matching solutions, like I said, whether it's embedded in EHR or it's a standalone MPI, um, and we've gotten very consistent um, resolution rates. You know, um, you know, simplistically just looking at it, you can see that in almost all these situations, we're able to automatically resolve over half of those backlogs or over half of the new incoming tasks that come in. So if you just think about this as kind of a, uh, a you know, a massive accelerator, okay, it doubles your, you know, it doubles your team's productivity for any HIM stewards that you have. Um, it's a really good way to think of it. So the, the last thing here uh, is just this picture of, okay, so let's say you don't have just one EHR, you don't have just one member management system if you're a payer. Um, the, uh, you have multiple EHRs or multiple member uh, patient data systems, um, then what does it look like? Well, in that case, um, we have an MPI offering. You register your identities as they're created into that. Um, the referential matching ensures that every record gets assigned this, you know, unique, distinct Verado ID, um, and that's the ID that you could aggregate on. So from an interoperability perspective, from an analytics perspective, you just simply aggregate on that ID um, this is something that, in addition to individual healthcare organizations using, we're working with a variety of platform vendors, you know, analytics vendors, um, people who are delivering services to, um, you know, healthcare clients. Um, they use this kind of approach to, to, to get the benefits of reference matching in a very simple kind of deployable fashion. So I know we, we did get some good questions coming in through the chat, I think we're up against it on time. Um, so maybe I'll just, uh, maybe I'll just kick it over to you, Jason, to, to wrap up here in the last minute we got. Yeah, and in terms of the questions, we'll reach out uh, individually to everybody to make sure that their questions are answered. There's questions around, you know, is the credit report data the only data we're getting? No, we're getting data from other utilities and, and some other facets uh, of the sort of data landscape. So we'll reach back out directly with you guys and, and give you the answers to your questions. Um, but just to wrap things up, I think you, we've heard about, uh, you know, auto steward in terms of plugging into your existing EHR and really handling the, that backlog uh, and the new things that can be created uh, to reduce uh, really your dependence on sort of manual stewardship. And then the UMPI, uh, as uh, Joaquin pointed out, the, an ability to really deploy, quickly deploy full-fledged EMPI technology, leveraging that same referential matching approach, which inherently doesn't produce the you know, the task volume, the backlog that uh, traditional EHRs produce. Um, if there's more questions, feel free to reach out to us at sales at verado.com um, or at the website. There's plenty of uh, material and, and information. Uh, but in terms of the questions, we'll reach out directly back to the participants um, to answer those directly with uh, everyone. And we really do uh, thank everyone for their time and appreciate them uh, taking time out of their day to, to hear from us. Great, thank you very much. So that does conclude our program for today. I want to thank everybody for participating in our program. I uh, certainly want to thank our speakers, Joaquim and Jason, for sharing their insights. And as you said, as you heard, uh, they would be happy to follow up with you on any specific questions that you do have after this event. So on behalf of our host, Health Data Management, and our sponsor, Verado, thank you all for joining us, ladies and gentlemen. Have a great day.